In section 2.2, we're going to talk about the derivative, a hugely important concept in calculus. And what I want to do to kind of introduce it is bring back an example that we talked about a couple of videos ago when we first introduced average rate of change. And the idea there is I gave you some function. I gave you the graph of it as pictured here. And the idea with this function is the input, the x variable, represented time, and the output, the f of x or y variable, represented position. And I think the story that I told you is I was going hiking. And I wanted to track how many miles, maybe that's the unit here, I had traveled for a given number of hours the unit on the horizontal axis. So the fact that zero zeros on the graph just means that after zero time at the start of my hike, I haven't gone anywhere. But since one six is on my graph, one hour into my hike, I had traveled apparently six miles. And we answered lots of questions with this example, but one question that I asked and never really answered or maybe didn't answer sufficiently is whether I'm walking faster one hour into my hike than I am eight hours into my hike. Maybe we were able to kind of intuitively understand that the answer to this question was yes, I am walking faster one hour into my hike than eight hours into my hike. The fact that this graph is kind of getting less and less steep, informally speaking, as I travel to the right, essentially means that I'm slowing down. During the first hour from time zero to time one, I go from position zero all the way to position six. I travel six whole miles. And if you compare that, for example, to this hour later in the day from time eight to time nine. At time eight, I was already 19 miles into my hike. And at time nine, it looks like I'm 20 miles into my hike. So my change in position over this hour was only one mile. It sure looks like I'm moving faster early on than I am later on in my hike. However, the point that I wanna make clear is this argument does not tell me that I'm moving faster at this instant than I am at this instant here. Really what it tells me is that my average speed over the first hour was greater than my average speed over the last hour of this hike. Average speed was the topic when I first introduced this example back in the average rate of change section. And since average speed is just how far did you go divided by how long did it take you, in the instance where position is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis, it's just the change in y divided by the change in x. In other words, the slope of the secant line. My average speed over this first hour was six miles per hour. And we can represent that visually with this secant line in green that has a slope of six. And maybe you're like, yeah, 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 I got all that out of average rate of change. Why are we reviewing this stuff? Well, in this section, we're not interested in average speed. We're interested in instantaneous speed. We're finally gonna be able to answer this question that I posed several videos ago. And it'll turn out that we can represent instantaneous speed by calculating a slope also, but not the slope of the secant line, rather the slope of what's called the tangent line. Tangent lines are pretty complicated ideas in math, which is why you wait till calculus to learn about them. And we'll define it a lot more concretely as we go on. But for now, what I want you to understand is that to measure the instantaneous speed, what I need to do is calculate the slope of this tangent line, the line pictured in red. I already know how to calculate the slope of a secant line, that's just the average rate of change. So you might think that calculating the slope of a tangent line is gonna be really easy, but it turns out it's not. Before I get into how to calculate the slope of the tangent line, I wanna talk about why it makes sense that the slope of the tangent line gives us the instantaneous speed. The reason we were hiking faster in this first hour than this last hour is because for a given amount of x, our y is changing by a lot more. In this one hour, we move six miles. In this one hour, we only move one mile. Clearly, we're traveling a lot faster over this first hour. But since position is measured on the vertical axis here, another way of saying traveled further is saying our y coordinate changed more for a given x coordinate. A way to think about how much the y coordinate is changing by is thinking about how steep this curve is at any given point. So really to measure speed, all we need is the steepness of the curve. But that's problematic because the way we measure steepness is by calculating the slope. And the slope is an idea that's only defined for lines, not for curves. So what we really need to do is find a line that kind of represents this slope at a given point. And that's exactly what the tangent line does. If you consider this curve in purple at this point right here in red, and you ask yourself the question, how steep is that purple curve at that point in red? You might be able to ballpark the steepness just by looking at it. And if you were to do so, really what you'd be doing is asking yourself the question, how steep is the tangent line to the curve at that point? All a tangent line is, is the line that, loosely speaking, represents the steepness of the curve at a given point. It's the line that just kind of bumps up against the curve if you want at that point. It's the line that's pictured in red. 
You're probably pretty confused right now because this is a hugely confusing topic. So let me give you a quick recap of where we are and where we still need to go. What we want to do in this section is represent the steepness of the graph at a given point. But there's a problem. We don't know how to calculate the steepness of a curve. All we know how to do is calculate the slope of a line. So what we do is we take the curve and we find a line that represents the slope of the curve at a given point. That's this tangent line. The slope of the tangent line at a given point will be the steepness of the graph. But unfortunately, there's another problem. To calculate the slope of a line, you need two different points. The reason we were able to calculate the slope of the secant line is because the curve gave us two different points, 0, 0, and 1, 6. But when we're talking about a tangent line, we only have one point on the curve. If you just got one point, you can't calculate slope, right? The slope is the change in y over the change in x. Inherent in that definition, by using the word change, I need two different points. Damn, that's too bad. We can calculate the slope of a secant line, which might not appear to help us at all, but we don't know how to calculate the slope of a tangent line. Well, I got some good news for you. We're gonna use the slope of secant lines to calculate the slope of this tangent line. We're gonna use the slope of lines like the one you see pictured in green to calculate the slope of the line you see pictured in red, which will be the answer to this section. How are we gonna do so? Let me switch examples. I need a function that I have both the graph and the equation of. And since this graph was produced with an equation that's a little bit too advanced for this point in the class, I wanna use a different graph. Here's some function f of x. Its equation is x squared minus 4x plus 1, and its graph is shown here. It probably doesn't make sense to think about position and time because we have negative numbers, so it would get really complicated. So maybe let's throw out this application where we talk about average speed and instantaneous speed, and let's just think about secant lines and tangent lines. I have a curve f of x and a point on that curve 3, negative 2. What I want to know is what is the slope of the tangent line to this function at this point. I can draw the tangent line, or at least draw an approximation as you see here in red, and hopefully that line coincides with what you would kind of think the tangent line would look like at this point. If you were some tiny little ant walking along this curve right here, when you got to this point right here, you'd be walking uphill, right? Over here you're walking downhill, over here it's kind of flat, over here you start walking uphill. Since you're walking uphill, the slope of the tangent line should definitely be positive, how steep are you walking uphill? Well, I don't know, not as steep as I am over here, but definitely steeper than I am right here. If we had to calculate roughly how steep the curve is right here, can you see how the slope of this line in red would represent the steepness of the curve at this point? If so, great, you have an awesome intuitive understanding of tangent line. Because I've drawn this approximate tangent line, I can kind of ballpark its slope. It looks like it goes up, what, two units each time it goes over right one? So it looks like the slope is about two, but that's not super satisfying. We wanna be able to calculate the steepness of a curve, loosely speaking, without drawing an approximate tangent line and then ballparking the slope of that line that we draw. We want equations and precise answers. How are we gonna do that? Well, you might find this kind of annoying, but I'm gonna go back to what we learned with average rate of change. If I didn't want the slope of the tangent line, and I do want the slope of a tangent line, but if I didn't for a minute, if I instead wanted the slope of a secant line, I could pick any two points on this curve, so maybe this one where x equals 3 and this one where x equals 4, and it'd be super easy to calculate the slope of that line. I have two points. I know the coordinates of each of these points. This one's labeled, and this point right here is at, what, 4, 1? So I can use my average rate of change formula which just tells me the slope of the secant line is the change in the y values divided by the change in the x values. The change in the y values would end up being three, and the change in the x values would end up being one. The average rate of change is three divided by one. In other words, three. The steepness of the line in green is three. You're like, yeah, I learned that several sections ago. You keep telling me I don't care about the steepness of the secant line. I want the steepness of the tangent line. Good. Let's connect these two super important topics. We're so good with secant lines that we don't need to just do x values like three and four. We can do x values like three and three plus h. In fact, that's exactly the type of question that you probably saw on an average rate of change quiz. To figure out the slope of the secant line from x equals three to x equals three plus h, 
All we would do is call these x1 and x2 respectively, take f of x2 and subtract f of x1 and then divide that difference by x2 minus x1. This would give us some expression, some answer that involves the letter H that would tell us the average rate of change between two points where one of the two points is this initial red dot here and the other point is some arbitrary dot on this curve. Let me take advantage of technology to try to bring this point home. Here's an applet that I definitely did not make, but we can use for our purposes. Know that the equation of the function is x squared minus 4x plus 1, the same one that we have in our example. And what we want to do is calculate the slope of the tangent line at this blue point right here where x equals 3. Ignore this a plus h for now. We're focusing on this blue dot here and the tangent line to the graph at this point. This applet allows us to see the tangent line. Here it is in pink. And hopefully this matches your intuition of what the tangent line should look like. What I want to know is what is the slope of this tangent line? It turns out it's two. How is the calculator getting this two? Let me show you. What we're going to do is we're going to pick some other point. We'll call it a plus h and calculate the slope of the secant line between this blue dot and this red dot. In the instance where h equals one, a plus h would be four. So I'd be calculating the slope of the secant line from three to four. Here it is in green. Hopefully this all matches up pretty closely with what we did over here. But here's where technology comes into play. H doesn't have to be equal to one. The other point on the graph doesn't have to have an X coordinate of four. I can make H a little bit smaller. I can make H, I don't know, 0.56. If H were equal to 0.56, since a is equal to three, this point would have an x coordinate of 3.56. And if it had an x coordinate of 3.56, the secant line would be this line pictured in green. And the computer's smart enough to calculate the slope of that secant line is 2.56. And there's nothing special about 0.56. I can do this for any value of h. And any value of h is gonna lead to a different secant line, which is gonna have a different slope. But look what happens when that value of h gets really, really close to zero. Let me put it down here at 0 0.07. So A is three, H is 0 0.07, meaning my other point here is at 3.07. Look how similar the green line is to the pink line. They're almost indistinguishable. When the second point that I'm using to calculate the secant line gets really, really close to the first point that I'm using to calculate the secant line, the secant line gets really, really close to the tangent line. And that's not specific to this example. That'll work for all of the examples in our class. I can even make my second point a little bit to the left of my first point. I can make H slightly negative. The red point is to the left of the blue point, but I still end up with a secant line. And again, because the two dots are pretty close, the secant line is pretty close to the tangent line. You're like, okay, instead of making it really close to the tangent line, why don't we put the two dots right on top of each other and figure out the slope of the tangent line and then we'll be done. Why don't we make H equal to zero? Well, there's a problem with doing that. We can't calculate the slope of the secant line when H equals zero. Why? Because if h equals zero, then a plus h is the same as a. If h equals zero, I'm trying to use the point three for my first point and the point three for my second point. Think about what that would do to this formula. I would have f of three minus f of three divided by three minus three. I would have zero divided by zero. I'd get no information out of this formula. So the idea is not to make h equal zero. It's not to make the two points the exact same. It's to make the two points really, 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 really close together. If this is sounding like a different topic that we've learned in this class, that's great. Here's the huge takeaway for this entire section. When h gets really close to zero, in other words, the limit as h approaches zero, using our language from the limit sections. As h approaches zero, the slope of the secant line from three to three plus h is gonna be equal to the slope of the tangent line at that point. In other words, to answer this question, what is the slope of the line in red? All we have to do is set up this average rate of change problem and then take the limit as h approaches zero. Using symbols, f of three plus h minus f of three divided by three plus h minus three is exactly our average rate of change formula. What we're doing is we're tying on what we learned in the previous section about limits to that average rate of change formula. And when we put together average rate of change and limits, what we get is 
what's called the derivative. This notation, the way you say this is f prime of three, is how we denote the derivative in calculus. The way to think about it is the f represents the function, the prime represents the slope of the tangent line to that function. But you're like, which tangent line? Every point on this function has a different tangent line. Over here, the tangent line definitely has a negative slope, whereas over here at three, the tangent line has a positive slope. That's what this three represents. This tells you the x coordinate that we need to define the tangent line to this function. And in order to calculate the slope of that tangent line, we use this formula. And that's a little bit of a lie because nobody actually uses this formula. People instead recognize that, wait a minute, three plus h minus three, won't those threes always cancel out and just leave me with an h in the denominator? And the answer is, yeah, it will. Well, if they're always just gonna cancel out, why wouldn't I just use this formula, which is identical to what you see up here, except with a tiny bit of simplification going on. And I'd be like, yeah, you do. The only reason I wrote this is for its intuitive appeal so that we can see the average rate of change formula hidden inside this. But when we calculate derivatives, the formula that we will use is this guy right here. And the actual calculations will take some time and I'll do those in the next video. But in this video, what I really want you to understand is the ideas behind those calculations. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to calculate the slope of a tangent line. And you might not appreciate it right now, but calculating the slope of the tangent line by looking at the limit of different secant lines is an incredibly brilliant idea that took thousands of years of mathematics for people to come up with. It's the cornerstone of Calculus One, and it's the foundation that the next couple months of this class are gonna rely upon.